You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Attention Matters with your host, Alice Aspen March. Alice is here to discuss why the kind of attention we get and give to others is vital and impacts our behavior and our feelings. People can remember forever the kind of attention they got from teachers, parents and grandparents, dentists, from everyone in their lives, especially when it feels good and or feels bad. Alice is here to give you tools to intervene in your attention factor. So please welcome the host of Attention Matters, Alice Aspen March. We're alive. It's a Tuesday. And we're at we're at Why Our Attention Matters, brought to you by Brave Bold, Bold, BraveMedia.com and other platforms. And I'm very, very excited today to have a a super lady on as my guest. Her name is Wendell Kornfeld. Welcome, Wendell. Thank you, Alice. I'm so pleased to be on this call. You know, when I moved to New York 10 years ago, you were the first woman I think I kept bumping into. You were everywhere. Everywhere I went, you were there. <laughs> it was so, Well, it was, if, if we kept running into each other, that meant you were out as much as I was, right? Well, yes, but it was nice for me because in Cal- I lived in California for 45 years, and I really did know a certain community, and I had not met that community here. So you were like, you were my first friend, I think, even if you didn't know it. Ah, uh, what an honor. So, Thank you for telling me that. So uh, I had good taste, didn't I? I picked you up. So mm-hmm. I want... I want <laughs> You're my 51st guest. So that's a special distinction. I've been doing this for over a year because, as you probably know, I talk about attention a lot because Mm -hmm. it's our primary need. It's everybody's primary need, no matter what color we are, no matter how fat or thin or rich or poor or old or young. We all need attention. And you have started a group whose primary goal is to give the people who join, and they're all seniors. But I want you to, and I want you to talk about why you did this and and what has happened. It's it's now global, is it not? Your CAF community as C- family. community as family. That yes, exactly. Yes, and uh, uh, just a minor correction in that uh, this is this is a concept. Community as family. It's a, an empowerment structure, and it is for older people. Uh, we do have people in their fifties, which is the probably the ideal time to start thinking about the issues that we talk about. But we do have uh, older people, definitely. And the reason I got into it is that. Back in the, I guess, early 90s, my husband and I, who do not have uh, children, found we were taking care of our mothers and giving them all sorts of different support. And we would say to each other, who's going to do this for us when we're this age? And we have a lot of friends who do not have children. And again, everyone was saying, oh, I do this for my parents and that, and I really am worried about not having anyone. So... I took a a certificate course in the early 90s called The Psychology of Aging, and I learned that nobody's really prepared for old age because the changes that come with it are unlike anything we've experienced before. It's almost like being plunked down in a new city where you don't know the language, you don't know how to get around, you don't know who to ask for directions or recommendations. So 
after taking this, that uh, course uh, for a couple of years, I said, when I retire, my new job is going to learn how to be really good at being older because I want to anticipate the changes that are happening so that if they're similar to what our moms were, had been going through, I want to figure out how are we going to deal with it without having the benefit of those wonderful adult kids. Yeah, you know, you were a very thoughtful, conscious, smart lady, because to decide to do that when you retired is just an amazing, um, it's just amazing, because it's, it's, it's really sort of crept up on us. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know, I guess I, I know, um, Bernice, Bernice got me involved. That's she's living in Los Angeles again. But I said, oh, "Okay, yeah. I'll go." And uh, I, I don't come too much because I have other things to do. But every time I come, I go. I am so excited that I'm there because oh, I nice get exactly what you started. And now that one group that I am in. I mean, is this your this is your pilot program, right? And now it's gone global. Well, what happened is I started uh, this 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 was started in early 2014. I started doing pilot groups in people's homes of about six to eight people, and I did that for about a little over a year. And I invited everybody that I knew and their friends who didn't have uh, adult kids who were in their 50s and 60s, some in their 70s. And we got together and we said, all right, let's talk about the stuff we did for our family members. All right. Do we think we're going to have similar issues? If so, what's our plan? If we don't think we're going to be like our parents, okay, is that magical thinking? Or, you know, let's really look at it. And I found that people were so enthusiastic because they had all been so worried about thinking about the future. And once they realized that this was a demographic, that there were plenty of people with the same concerns and that there were things we could do to anticipate and plan and put into place, it made them feel more empowered. So in early 2015, we brought it to uh, my synagogue. They asked me to bring the structure there. And then um, I got all these invitations to speak at different places and write articles. And I was dealing then with senior centers, uh, groups of neighbors, churches, and synagogues around the country. You know, this is so meaningful to me because the one thing that I keep hearing so much when even I talk about attention and the lack of attention that seniors are getting it's a demographic that is so blatantly lonesome and doesn't feel seen. In other words, they feel invisible and forgotten. And what you've created is so relevant to where we are now. You know, I came in late because I, I, uh, I didn't know about it before. But that question of what did we do for our parents, that's a very, I have to say, pregnant question. Because mm -hmm. as an only child, I was the only one who did anything for my mother after my father died. And, you know, sure. uh, it was a big, it was a lot of responsibility. I didn't, and I didn't have anybody to talk it over with. Now, that's another facet of what you're doing, I think. Absolutely. Had, well, one of the things that we talk about in the group, I mean, there's like three pillars to, to the structure of community as family. One of them is to don't be afraid of getting older. It, it is a privilege. It can and should be among the best years of your life. So embrace it. Don't get into denial and, you know, start buying stuff that says anti-aging. I mean, that's, if that doesn't even make sense. But accept the fact that this is who you are and that you're being given this gift. The second part is to create an A-team for yourself. If you don't have close family, look at the community you do have, your friends, your neighbors, professionals, co-workers if you're working. Create that A-team that, that a for yourself and be part of the A-team for those people. Uh, I always say it's easy to hire people to care for you, like to hire a home health aide or, or you know, anybody in those service industries. What you can't pay for 
is to get someone who cares about you, someone who cares what happens to you. That's where relationships come in. So the second pillar of community of family is get out there, start meeting more people, do more things, create those nurturing mutual relationships. The third part is learn where learn to be your own best self advocate. Learn where your resources are. Who does what in your community? Whether it's the local government, the state government, the federal government, uh, senior centers. I mean, it's, it's unlimited, but find out who does what and figure out how do those systems work for you. Learn how to access them. So those are the kind of the three pillars of, of community as family, is to, pe- is to have a community, to embrace who you are now, and to get as smart as you can about how things work. You, you know, um, I keep doing research about attention because we don't really talk about it a lot. You know, uh, I came here, I had been an executive director of a nonprofit which talked about the impact of, of TV on our families, and that kept me very busy for four and a half years. And that was the first time I ever heard the word need. And we, I was called on to run a conference and determine what the needs, what children needed to see on television. And it was uh, 145 people came. But we, we didn't grow up really um, thinking about our needs. At least I didn't. And I think our job today is to talk about them, to tell our parents what we need, to tell our partners what we need. But that's, that's another way of discussing self-care. Now people oh, are really using that term, uh, self-care. I never heard of self-care before. But this is really what you're teaching and what you're talking about and what you're giving anybody who comes to these meetings an opportunity to listen to how other people carry on their self-care. And that's a big deal. That's a real gift, Wendell, to well, hear well, how others you. do self-care. You know, it is. It's so important not to feel alone. Life is not easy. We, we need allies and we need empathy. Well, you know, years ago, uh, people lived in villages. They actually lived in clans. I'm reading a book about this. Hmm. And uh, the Italians, when they came from a place in Italy, sucked together in Massachusetts. And they had no disease and no illness because they were taking care of each other in this village in Los a- in, in Massachusetts. They stayed in their village, and really a, a lot of them were related to each other. But then they grew, they grew up and they wanted to be Americanized and they wanted to reach out to Boston. And it's interesting, they developed illness and and now we're going to go, now we're going back to villages. You know, last week I had a guest yes. on who talked about the village, which you know a lot about. I mm-hmm. I just heard about it for the first time. How does your how does community as family differ from the village movement? We we the village movement is uh, works better probably in a, a suburban setting because it's about people literally helping each other do things like if you need if you don't drive anymore and you need someone to drive you someplace if you can't cut your lawn anymore and you need someone to mow the lawn for you a lot of it is is an exchange of services as well as as building a community here in manhattan it's it's quite different doing things for one another in a community as family group is kind of the byproduct that comes is the happy result of getting together in the first place so for example you uh if you get together with people for community as family it takes a little while to get to know each other and build that trust and community then you can start saying let's trust each other to help each other Wendell, we have to take a commercial break, but this is where I want to go when we come back. And we'll be back and we'll be alive. And if you want to talk to us, 
We're at 866-451-1451. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Patricia Fayeweather Harlow is passionate about the environment and conserving our natural resources. She's written a five-part book series for all ages called Rock with Rodney and Party with Perky to Preserve Wildlife, which brings awareness through these vibrant characters on preserving and protecting our national parks and historic landmarks. Harlow has launched a campaign to mobilize green supporters, informing a united front against big oil, big coal, and the Keystone XL pipeline. And she addresses the controversial practice of fracking in books four and five. She's determined to bring greater awareness to the dangers of drilling and running crude oil through pipelines that cut through pristine landscapes. And she empowers readers to take action in keeping America beautiful. To learn more about Patricia Fayweather Harlow and to purchase her books, visit www.patricia-fayweather-harlow.com. That's F-A-Y-E-R-W-E-A-T-H-E-R. And play your part in preserving the landscape that we all share and love. Wendell, tell me what you did before your career, please. I want to know what you did. My career? Well, there were several things over a 46-year span. Um, I would say the ones that took the most time, I used to write and produce... um, TV and radio commercials for mostly for Broadway shows, for entertainment accounts, and like Off Broadway, Ringling Brothers Circus, gambling casinos, what they call entertainment dollars. So I used to write and produce TV and radio commercials for that. Um, then I spent many years as a um, senior VP of a photography and art publishing company. I was there 20 years. And the last 10 years of uh, full-time work, I was working at, uh, for a nonprofit, for a humanitarian organization that, pro- that taught ophthalmologists the latest eye surgeries and eye care in the developing world. And they did that by refitting an airplane as a surgical and teaching hospital that flew all around to the developing world. And I used to um, write uh, risk management policies for that, like what if, what, if this hap- what if this thing went wrong with this or whatever. So I had to think in terms of worst case scenarios all the time, which my mother gave me plenty of great training to do because she saw disaster and everything. So um, I, I'm very good at looking at the, the long big picture Like, what could go wrong, and how can we either prevent it or at least mitigate the negative effects? So you were interested before this in in meeting people's needs, determining what they needed. Did you know I grew up, I don't think you did, as an ophthalmologist's daughter? I rem- yes, I remember your dad was a was a physician, but I didn't remember he was an ophthalmologist. Yes, he was. So this year, Wendell, is very significant for both of us, 2020. Yeah, yes, yes. It's when we should yes. really That's a year see of good this. vision, I hope, yes. <laughs> yeah, clearly, clearly. Well, that answers some of my questions because you were a very busy lady, in, and doing a lot of things with people, you know. Um, well, you know, Dorothy Parker, one of my favorite writers uh, that I like to quote, uh, once said, people are more fun than anybody. And <laughs> uh, I definitely have always enjoyed people. 
good, bad, and ugly, or whatever, find them fascinating. My dad was a head of personnel for the, as it was called before, um, HR personnel for the Federal Reserve Bank. And as a kid at the dinner table, we would always be entertained with stories about people he interviewed for jobs, you know, some of their strengths or idiosyncrasies, and, but also why he would hire some and why others not. And uh, that helped me also become very, very interested in people. Um, I started doing volunteer work even in my early 20s. I, I worked for the International Center for a while, helping um, people from other countries learn English. And I have, right now, I have seven or eight volunteer jobs that I do uh, over and above a community as family. So I definitely thrive uh, learning from other people, sharing things I know with them to to help their lives be better. I get back tenfold of whatever I give, Alice. Well, I, I wrote down today that you were a woman of many gifts, and I didn't even know how many. I loved what you were doing. You know, relation, relationships are really the most important thing we have. And yes, as, I agree. Well, you did not have children. I did because I was an only one, and I didn't have any brothers or sisters. And I grew up as a mother of three sons, two of whom you have met. That's right, yes. Was, yeah, there was a lot going Lovely on gentlemen. at my house, a lot. Because I just, I had people over all the time. I had other boys over all the time. And this past, what is it, 16 weeks now, has been harder for me because when I when I was about I don't know forty I guess I said Mom what did I do as a as a child She said You played outside, and I yeah. haven't been able to play outside in all this time. Yeah. So um, it's been really interesting to live that way right now. So I have really turned into a teenager. This is ah. my personal journey during this, whatever we're on, vi virus thing. And um, my father... Tell me more doctor, about that. What? <laughs> Tell me more about turning into a teenager. Give me an example, please. Well, it's very interesting because my dad did not believe in, in an adolescence. He never had oh. one, so he didn't know what it was about, and he didn't believe in it. So... So I, I had one day of adolescence in Detroit, Michigan. My father left his office. My mother took me downtown by the bus, and we went shopping for a party dress for me. I was 13. And they uh, I would come in from the, uh, from the fitting room, and uh, I'd wear all these dresses, and they'd say, oh, we really like that one. And they said it about a dress that I absolutely abhorred. That's your dress, Alice. I said I hate it. It was pea green. It was awful. Well, it was awful. But they insisted on buying it for me, and I said I will never wear it. And you know what? I never did. And I knew what I was doing. But a one-day adolescence isn't enough to develop to, to to make the journey that you need to make between childhood and adulthood. Mm, I agree, yes. So um, what am I doing? I'm very, um, I'm being naughty all over the place. I'm not showing uh -oh. up to things. Uh -oh. I'm, I'm going late to programs, to Zoom and everything. And I know, I feel like I'm consciously acting out because yeah. I was so judged as a child in my household, they were the king and queen of judges. And oh, so I yeah. learned recently that I really don't have to judge myself like my, my, my parents did. That's a big awareness to me, you know? Oh, uh, mm -hmm. I think that the real uh, damage or weakness that I grew up with was that I didn't have anybody to talk to in my family, you know, oh. to say, what's wrong with them today? I never had that opportunity. But anyway, I'm almost through with my teenage. I've done a lot of other things, but I don't remember what they were. But I feel differently. I feel different. I feel like I have been an adolescent and arrived 
at knowing what I need now and to speak up for what I need. I never did, believe it or not. Um, mm -hmm. And I was a selective mute, which meant that I didn't talk at all until I was three, uh, until I was uh, in kindergarten. And I've had to wonder about that because I was a doctor's daughter. And so the community in Detroit, Michigan was wondering what was wrong with me. And my, my parents learned that they were talking about Jerry Spiro's daughter and they became very ashamed of me because I wasn't verbal. Mm -hmm. So that all go, you know, you carry all that into adulthood when you don't get the kind of attention you need. And I've asked thousands of people, How, have you gotten the attention you need today? You know what they do? They laugh. It's such an outrageous concept. So here I come along in my adulthood, and uh, I, I don't know anything about attention. As a matter of fact, when, when I went to therapy for the first time, and this is all the backstory of why I'm so passionate about the attention factor, um, the first man I, I worked with said, Alice, what do you need? I said, what do you mean, what do I need? I didn't even understand the question. So, uh, so it's a I, luxury being asked that. That's quite a gift to have somebody actually ask you that. Well, that's what I'm working on. And I go to this very, very highly achieving group of people. And the last, and it meets in various locations. And the la uh, one of the last times I went was in uh, California, where they've got that huge. Um, aquarium. You know, I'm losing things. I can't remember. It starts with an M. It's not Mendocino, I know. Monterey. Monterey. Uh, oh, Monterey, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, and, also San Diego uh, has one, one, I think. Weekend, they put you in different groups because they know what you do, and so you have to announce yourself and what you're doing. And uh, I have a, an AB in English, but they have like 10 initials after their names. So I was very intimidated when I went first. I'm not anymore because the last time I was there, I introduced myself and I said, I used to be intimidated. I mean, the man who put the machine on Mars is there. They've got... Wow. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to go into that. But when I left, two women came up to me separately and said, Alice, don't stop doing what you're doing because my husband asked me if I was, if he was giving me the right kind of attention. Mm. So uh, you're right. And that's what I teach. That's one of the things I say. Just sure. ask everybody. Ask your employees. Ask your partners. Ask your kids. It's a wonderful conversation to have with kids because when you were growing up, did anybody ask you what kind of attention you wanted? Uh, no, I've had to because, boy, I was I was uh, drowning in it, but I loved it. <laughs> yeah, of course, because it's your primary need. But you know what? We our parents give us they do give us attention, but more often than not, it's not what we need; it's what they need. That's a very that does happen. Complicated, complex. Uh, it's complicated, but anyway. So I, I so appreciate what you bring to the table. It's wonderful. And you are such, you are the perfect person to start this. And, but you, well, you, you know what, Alice? Excuse me. The, the reason I started it is because I needed it. I needed a group of like-minded people with the same concerns so that we could figure it out together. And nothing like that existed. And, you know, when you think of what Gandhi said, you know, be the change that you want. I figured if nobody else is doing this, this is going to be my legacy. This is what I do to help help other people who don't have the support of family to embrace the best years of their lives by being more prepared for it in, in all these different ways and to know they're not alone. They can come out of the closet. You know, they can say they don't have to be ashamed of not having a family. They don't have to be apologetic. They don't have to be embarrassed. It's 
We are Legion. Come on out and join us. We have to take another commercial break, but I want to go right back here because, Wendell, I do my work for the same reason you do your work. We'll be back in a few, alive again. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central State. Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Leip is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. And we're back and we're very much alive. Wendell and I were talking during the commercial break, and she said the magic word, invisible. Now, let me just preface this before I give you, before it's your turn. You know, attention can be invisible and visible at the same time. You can see attention. You can hear it. But most of all, we feel it. So I want to hear why... You, why well, you mentioned that word? Because it's just turned me right on. Yeah, well, on. you mentioned it earlier in the call, and uh, certainly there's a certain irony about what has been happening the past few months in, in, in our world because of this pandemic. Um, I guess it was in Mar- early April, maybe, I was interviewed by the New York Times by uh, a, a writer who specializes in writing about issues for older people. And he had called me up. He said, let me pick your brain about some things about how this pandemic and is, is affecting older people. And I said to him, it's really a cruel irony because for the past several years, so many people in the uh, geriatric, gerontological, senior issues world, and, and there are many, have been hammering older people demographic that, you know, don't, don't get isolated get more engaged with life, more engaged with your community, do more things, be seen, you know, contribute, all right? And now (laughs) we've all been told to stay home, especially the older people. So it is a cruel irony that we took so many steps forward and then we got put back again. This won't last forever, but older people, yes, they do become invisible. It is a, a more of a youth-centered society, and it's unfortunately there is ageism. There's ageism against young people that they don't know enough and still wet behind the ears. So how can you take them seriously? And then there's prejudice against older people that they are beyond contributing, that they can't learn, uh, they're boring and they're ugly. Right? So that's another reason why older people get invisible the the manifestations of being older such as wrinkles and gray hair and some frailty that's seen as 
something so negative and so frightening that people don't want to look at it. So people get uh, invisible. If you're an introvert, it's even worse because y you can't even force yourself to go out and do things. It's painful because you've been an introvert all your life. So the invisibility means we're not taken seriously enough. There's not enough products and services that work because a lot of them, they design them and don't beta test them on older people. Or they also don't allow older people to be part of the design process. So there's a, a million reasons why older people are invisible. And it was starting to change. It's a long process. Um, but it's so important. And as a, 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 a social worker some years ago who specializes in older people said to me, you know, Wendell, we could help more people if we could just get them out of their apartment, find out who they are. It's, New York City is a great place to hide because everybody delivers. You don't have to go out. But again, you have millions of people probably who have so much to offer and they, ha they need so much attention, as you would say, from other people. But we can't get to them. So that's, that's my thing about uh, why we're, there's so much invisibility. Well, it also, you know, if you have felt invisible in your family, you're going to take that into the rest of your life. And if you don't go through a process of determining what your needs are, aside from your family, if you don't take yourself seriously, and I think this is a real problem, because we don't take our kids seriously. We're so busy. At least this is my... This is what happened to me, and this is my opinion. They were so busy trying to survive and have a perfect child that I couldn't take myself seriously. So I grew up not taking myself seriously, and that has been in the way. Now, I want to, in of my work a little bit, I want to tell you about our younger kids. I've had many, it's amazing, I've had many experiences of younger people wanting to know what I do. I got on a subway last year and I, uh, a man, a young man moved so I could sit next to him and I don't know how we're talking, but he could not stop talking to me because I was telling him what I had discovered and he, he said, this is just amazing to me. And, and I've, had, I've had interns in my house who have said it's changed their lives. And I've had people say after a workshop, I will never feel invisible again. So what I'm really doing with my work is I'm alerting people. That's, I'm a, it's, and I think maybe my, the name of my book will have something to do with alert. Because we have never seen attention the way I see attention. I don't know why I had an epiphany with that one word over my head when I was looking for the role I played in my youngest son's dysfunctional behavior. He went from being a heavy television viewer to using drugs. And I was terrified that I could lose him in Los Angeles. I wanted to know what role I had played. And my, my last boyfriend, really, uh, who I married, uh, said, you got to go to uh, UCLA to hear this professor. You'll love him and he'll love you. And I'm taking his course. And his course was called Obstacles to Intimacy. Interesting title. And one of the first things he said was, I want to tell you about Harry Harlow's monkeys. Harry Harlow was a social scientist. And he, put, he took his monkeys and put them in cages and put them, put two wire monkeys up on the wall of the cage and watched. He wanted to see what would happen if they were taken away from their families. And this is what happened. They all, uh, the, the one wire monkey had terry cloth on it, so they would hang on the terry cloth monkey because it was so, the softest thing in the cage and only went over to the other, uh, other uh, uh, monkey, which was holding baby bottles to eat. So he said, when babies were, when baby monkeys were in their cages long enough, they became socially disconnected. They they only they only went to the ba baby body monkey 
I'm so excited about this because it's the beginning of what I do. Um, I'm getting tongue-tied. Anyway, he finally said, when they're in their cages long enough and they don't get the kind of attention they need, they die. Mm -hmm. And I did some other work. And there's another person who found out the same things. When orphans don't get the kind of attention they need. Now, orphans, orphans in, in orphanages, fine. They get fed. They get clothed. They get water. They get... They don't get what they need. They aren't cuddled. Nobody right. talks to them. Nobody looks at them. Right. And that's what I'm talking... See, it's all over. But... Um, yeah, it's failure to thrive, course, yes. They don't thrive. That's exactly right. So about, in, about another week, I'm at home, and I have this epiphany over my head, the word attention. Now, I've been looking for reasons why I'm in this position of trying to... I thought I was a good enough mother. Evidently, I wasn't. Um, but I wasn't finding anything because attention, the word, was not in the back of any books I had at home for my other work. Can you believe it? It never appeared mm -hmm. except with ADHD and ADD. I, I couldn't I believe think it. Attention it was a is a word. Excuse me, I think attention is a word the meaning of which has evolved because probably 40, 50 years ago um, uh, someone would say, of course I give my kid attention. I, I, as you say, I gave him the bottle, you know, I changed the diaper, I put his toys out, whatever. But attention that you're talking about is really someone saying to another person, I see you. I hear you, and I at that you. point, yes, and I feel what's happening here, and and if we are motivated and able to do something to make that person function better, feel better, then then that is a beautiful thing that we're giving them, or they give us. When no, we feel attention, and we can see attention. We could go in a grocery store and watch a mother yank her kid's arm out of its socket practically because it's begging so much for something. That is negative attention. We see that happening all over the place. There are only two kinds of attention, good and bad. And the kind of attention we get is the root cause of our feelings and our behavior. And when I say that, people, it's like they register. It registers. I didn't know anything about attention except what I saw on a billboard attention sale or stop pay, or start paying attention to me. That's not what I'm talking about. Exactly. Attention shoppers. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so many parents don't know. My parents didn't because they didn't get what they needed. They give their kids the kind of attention that they need, that they wish they'd got. Do you know that our college kids are dropping out now in their junior years because their parents have given them so much attention by, by, by doing everything for them and robbing them of a sense of empowerment. They even yeah. go and buy houses in the communities they live in so that they can be closer to their kids. And the, the rate of suicide is rising in this age group because they've taken every bit away from their, from their kids because they thought if they gave them everything they needed, that's, what, that's how they would grow up. I get, I get yeah. crazy over this. Yes, yeah, I certainly read that many times. You're right. Yep. So we have to start over. We have to start over in, inside, inside of us, and determine what we need first. Because only when you know what you need do you even have an idea that your children need what they need, and it's probably not what you think. So you've got to ask right. them. You've got to. You've got to ask for it. Absolutely. Knowing it is one thing. Asking for it is another. Sure. Oh my goodness. Look at how fast this has gone. 
When, uh, well, I'm going to have to have you back on. There's too much to talk about. And you've been a wonderful guest. And I loved having you here. And how can people reach you? Uh, they can reach me. The easiest way is through email. And then I, I set up uh, things. We take it from there. We can do Zoom. We can do all sorts of things. And what is your email, please? It's my full name, Wendell Kornfeld, no spaces, and then the digit one at gmail.com. And we got to go now, but you're right. There is only one Wendell Kornfeld. You are a wonderful guest. I'll have you back. Thank you so much for being here. The earliest human societies worshipped a female goddess. Little is known about this time because we did not always have a written recorded history. It was around 3100 BC when the Sumerians invented the first written language and everything that preceded this time is prehistory. The prehistorical record includes all of women's unwritten history from 30,000 B.C. to the time that men began achieving political power around 3,000 B.C. Male feminist artist Kimberly Berg maintains a strong position in educating and inspiring both men and women through his devotional art to the goddess in all women. Studying their history is paramount to understanding who women were and who they would become later living in a patriarchal society. To learn more about this important time in our history, go to www.isisrising.net. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. And we're back. And we're alive. And I'm getting so excited about talking to Wendell Kornfeld about what we're talking about that I thought we were through. But we weren't through. We have more time. And I want to ask Wendell to give us a give us a, a, a story. We need a story about now to redeem myself. It's your turn. Okay. <laughs> okay I can tell you a little story. Uh Senator uh, Liz Kruger is a she's a state senator here in New York City, uh, in the Upper East Side, and for the past several years she's been having these wonderful what she calls roundtables, and it's once a month for about an eight month period of the of the year, and in the very beginning she, the name of the the roundtable was called Roundtable for Seniors, and they would bring in all sorts of speakers that uh, worked at various offices and institutions and uh, service agencies in the city to talk to older people so at least they knew what was available and how it worked. Well, they were, they couldn't, they, they were confused because they weren't getting as big a turnout as they thought, even though they served breakfast, they had nice bagels and coffee. And they said, how come more people aren't coming? There's so many seniors in this city, especially in this area. And then they had the, the brilliant idea of changing the name of the round table to the round table for seniors and boomers well that took off like hotcakes then people started really showing up and uh i have been going i guess three years now to senator kruger's uh, monthly round tables and I have met amazing people who are great speakers who work in city government or they work in uh, senior services. They work in housing, medical, uh, the arts, everything geared towards older people. The turnout uh, is, is huge, even though it's 830 in the morning. And something happened uh, a couple of months ago that I thought was just great. 
there was a speaker talking about all the various uh, services that their city agency provided for older people. And we can do this, and if you're eligible for that, we can do this. And then when it was Q&A time, one gentleman stood up and he said to the panel of speakers, old people don't want services. We want to be empowered. And I was thinking, oh, my God, people who know me are going to think I paid him to say that. It, it, was, it was wonderful to hear this man say that. And what he was saying was we are vibrant people. We may be old, but we are vibrant. We are citizens of this great city. We have lives and interests and feelings. And we've got brains, and we want to contribute. What we need is to have more power, more visibility, more power to actually achieve the goals we want. We want to do a lot of this stuff for ourselves. Just tell us how to go about it. We'll take it. So he was my hero of the week, and that is what Community as Family strives to do, is to teach you how to be your own best self-advocate, find out how things work, and keep contributing. Don't, uh, don't fall into that trap of people who think old people are just a drain on resources. That is a, a, an ageist concept, and it's wrong. So that is my little story for the day about about that wonderful man who said, don't give us stuff. We want to be empowered. That's what we want. Now, I love it. He's my new best, my new best friend. Has anything specific happened since he stood up and said that? Um, certainly not in the way the city is run, but I think by saying it out loud, it was very important to these people that work for all of these agencies to hear this, that they're not just delivering all this stuff to people, that we're just sitting back and waiting for someone else to do something for us. We want opportunity. That what they were hearing was we want opportunities to buy into the whole system so we're part of our own solution. Whether whether somebody has been able to change things within their agency and to think about doing differently, hard to say. All these kind of things are, are cultural. Some of it you have to get past all the politics and policies. But at least that was out there for them to hear. And that's another part of why we can't allow ourselves to be invisible. It's all part of the attention we want. We've got to get out there. And we tell people that because they may say, whoa, that never occurred to me. Just like some of the people you work with say, attention, how come never, no one ever talked about it before? Well, empowerment for older people, it's a lot different uh, and a lot more effective than just creating services that are delivered. That is a super story, Wendell. And what I would like to hear, I would like to be able to follow that up some way and see if they put this nice man on a committee. He was asking to be included. Yes, and he was wow. speaking for so many of us. I'm sure there are some people, you know, let's, let's face it, our parts do wear out as we get older, and sometimes our minds are not as sharp. And, you know, we can't say, oh, everybody should be working the, the same 100%, you know, firepower that we had when we were 40 or 50 or even 60. We do have to work with what we've got, with the, with the reality that we have. But on the other hand, we can't all be written off. Whatever, whatever strengths we do have, whatever energy we have, and most of all, what curiosity we have, that should get us out of the house and having our, our tongues talking uh, because that's how change comes about. And I want to say that when you give people the kind of attention they need, they get energized. Yes. It feeds them. And so it feeds them because people want to know, they want to be recognized for the unique, absolutely. beautiful soul they are. And they yes. want to have a place in the world. They want something that people need from them. They, uh, we want to know that we're 
that were uh, capable, capable, and that we can, if we're supported, this, we will bring a lot more to the table because we've lived a lot longer. I think exactly. now we have to go. No, I think I have five more minutes. I'm so mixed up with the time today. I'm so glad we had extra time to hear that story because if one person listens and repeats what that man did, that man has to feel very good about himself that he felt that he could stand up and say that. And yep. I hope that more and more people will say that. You know, that's what these kids wanted to hear from me what kind of things I would bring to the table. And they were in their 20s, both of them. The other one was in a, I took a taxi with me and he wouldn't stop talking to me. He said, I've never heard this before. So mm. uh, it's, uh, I think sometimes it's too simple. People think they know all about attention, but I didn't know anything about the way I'm talking about it. So that's why I get so excited when I have an opportunity and I don't know what time it is. Anyway, I uh, <laughs> I hope I've recovered. You were a marvelous <laughs> guest. You taught me so much. And you taught our audience a lot. And I'm going to go with you to the next meeting. Please Good. let me know when All that right. is and get out of the house. This has uh, been a pleasure and an honor. Uh, thank you so much for letting me speak to your friends and your audience. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Well, for me too. And uh, please, okay, please repeat your website once more. I know it's Wendell Cornfield number one at Gmail. Gmail. Okay, people, write her, ask her questions. Okay, we're gone. We'll be live next week. All right. Stay healthy and well. <laughs> You've been listening to Attention Matters with your host, Alice Aspen March. Tune in each week as Alice will provide tools, insights, and an innovative perspective on how to consciously give and receive quality attention here on Attention Matters. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.